it is not our power, but our will and character that is being tested. Governor Rhodes' rhetoric and that betrayal Sunday evening, there was an extra edge of anger and frustration. One of the National Guard jeeps drove up to the front. They started reading uh, an order for everybody to disperse. There wasn't anything out of control. We had a right to be there, and they could not stop us from speaking. We were not an unlawful assembly. Get the hell off our campus. Then, of course, it's tear gas time again. Tear gas began to arc over, crowd into the crowd. By then, we'd gotten fairly good at being able to pick up uh, the cool end of, of the canister because it still runs hot. And toss it back. <laughs> Returning the favor. Now the National Guard started marching toward us. They had on helmets, gas masks, and they were carrying M1 rifles with the bayonets attached. And I was among hundreds of students. We ran up over Blanket Hill. The guardsmen came marching across the commons. They followed us up the hill, past the pagoda. We all ran down the other side of the hill into the Prentice Hall parking lot. We started picking up whatever we could, trying to throw it at the guard. Of course, we were at the bottom of a hill. It was not a really good strategic position. We didn't have steel helmets and gas masks to protect us. The tear gas exchange stopped, and students started chanting, they're out of gas. And then I see this, this one student with a black flag. Once the guard had stopped, sort of slowly work his way, and I'm saying, wow, there's my picture. And I stood there, I waved my black flag. I knew my life was in danger. But at that time, I thought, if I have to risk my life to make the most powerful statement I can make, I'm going to do it. I walked up behind my brother and I said, Alan, they're aiming right at you. This is getting really shaky. And just as I said that, Troop G just started to move away in a V formation and start their ascent up the hill. And I asked him to come back to the parking lot. And Alan said, wait, I, I want to see where they're going. And as I looked and my sister watched, they started marching up the hill. When they got to the top of the hill... They hit us. They didn't go anywhere. <clears throat> about a dozen men stopped, turned, raised their weapons. And so I got pointing a rifle towards me. The guardsman with the baton in his hand was saying, get set, get ready, fire. This metal sculpture just erupts in this cloud of rust. The tree, nice big chunk of bark comes off. The student got hit to my right. I was just knocked to the ground. The bullet hit my wrist. I thought, this is like a bad drink. We could hear bullets zipping past our heads and thumping into the ground. Jimmy Riggs pulled me behind the car, riddled with bullets. Tom Grace, he's screaming. I looked over. The boot was blown off of his foot. And he's yelling to me, stay down, stay down. And when you're caught in the open, being fired on, with no opportunity to defend yourself, it's the loneliest and sickest experience you can imagine.
just want to start by welcoming you all to the bright screening room tonight to uh, observe the 53rd annual uh, retrospective of Kent State. Uh, my name is Nico Yamak. I'm an Emerson alum and currently teaching here uh, in the School of Communication. Uh, before I dive into kind of my thoughts about what's going on and you know the, the, the generational trends that we're seeing today, I just want to unpack kind of what I'm experiencing while seeing these images on the screen. I'm not sure how many of you were able to see the film screening about 30 minutes ago, the dramatization of the events that you just saw on the screen. Um, it's quite powerful um, because what, again, is filmed and, and seems almost fictional in the moment is then so real watching the real footage right now. Um, and it really hit me because I was sitting next to somebody who's not from the United States. Um, and that person was having a very visceral reaction to the images on the screen. Um, and, and I was kind of gauging my reaction uh, in comparison to hers. And I was very, very calm, almost too calm, to the point where her reaction seemed out of the ordinary, which is weird because it's exactly how you should respond to seeing such horrific violence on the screen like that. And so I'll tell a personal story. I, I'm not a law student, but I am taking a course at Harvard Law right now about policing in America. Uh, and when I'm in this course, I was showing a few international students some images of the protests after the death of George Floyd right here in Boston. And for those of you who don't remember or weren't on campus at the time, you know, the National Guard was deployed as well. And so there's photos. I have screenshots on my phone of the National Guard in front of Little Building, guarding, boarded up Emerson College. Um, at the time, too, the night before, you know, the police had engaged with protesters. The cop cars were on fire. There was tear gas in the streets. And I'm showing these images to my classmates, again, not American. Uh, and it's bringing them to tears. Uh, and again, it's in these moments that I realize how desensitized I am and how desensitized you are as a generation to these acts of brutality and these acts of violence. And so it really just hits home when you compare it to something like that and you, and you really, again, start to, to unpack how cold and calculated you view it um, and how unflinching you are in the face of, again, such despicable violence. I think we talk a lot about desensitization, um, but what really hits home is I was asked to give this speech and to speak on some of the more recent issues of mass shootings, school shootings, and police brutality. And again, this is something that not only on an academic level that I study, but on a personal level is I'm quite passionate about, invested in. And I can't tell you, honestly, right now, in the moment, what was the last mass shooting. I can't tell you who the last victim of police brutality was, and I can't tell you what the last school shooting was, because it seems to me like every single day we encounter a new one, and a new, uh, just a new horrific event. And it comes at such a blistering pace that day after day, it, it just starts to fade away. And I, and I say that not to, to minimize um, or, or devalue you know, the lives of the people that were lost, or the victims, or the families, but it's just the reality of how much violence we, we, we take in day to day, um, and how much we're expected to just process and move on. Uh, and after a while, I think that's actually what we end up doing. And, and again, just being grounded in those moments and having that kind of international check uh, really helps me remember and, and why I'm fighting for a better future, but also why the work of people like John Philo is so important. And so, again, I, I just want to end by giving a little bit of historical context. I think you know, what came after this, right, uh, you know, Nixon, uh, President Nixon at the time, was so sure that you know, the college campuses, the students, we're working with some outside influencers, right? But this is the height of the, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and so you know, there's this idea that the people are being agitated from the outside. Um, and in so, right, he's he's on this mission, um, and he tries to mobilize what he calls the silent majority after this event um, of all the people who secretly believe that Nixon and and the protesters were in the wrong, but are too afraid to speak up. Um, and I say all that to say is, where have we heard those words more recently? And so I go back again to the death of George Floyd, and just not a month after the death, President Trump is tweeting about the silent majority. And so, you know, the fight of the 1970s and the Vietnam War and the protests that we saw on campuses and with students at the time uh, is, is still our fight today. Um, and that's troubling. Um, but I want to end on an optimistic note that every day as a teacher, uh, and as a student, and as a member of your generation, I'm inspired by how by how unwilling you are 
to stay in this vested in the status quo um, and how you're pushing for more equitable solutions more more just futures um, and it really is just like we saw in this film unfortunately but it really is students who are going to make that difference and young people who are going to push us forward um, and you guys are the progress that I hope to see so with that being said I just want to pa uh, pass it over to Dr. Payne and of course uh, our Pulitzer Prize winning photographer um, Greg Philo, uh, John Philo, excuse me, um, who will be talking about the events um, and uh, who can take us back to that day and give us some, some great historical context. So without further ado, Dr. Payne. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, everybody who has been involved in this. It's been a departmental effort, uh, especially the student ambassadors, my class, uh, Kent State and Jackson State, Shepard Fargo, and others. And also Lee Schwabel, who is in the audience tonight, he's been a big supporter of ensuring that we keep the injustice as well as the memory and the quest alive. So Lee, thank you so much. I might add that he not only is here, this is his second trip back to his alma mater, but he has been to my class, the Kent State Jackson State class, which has looked at both of these tragedies. And he said to me early on, I'm impressed by your students, many of whom are here tonight, and they're from around the world. So when we look at these types of injustices and, and governments that have gone awry, we have to remember a couple of things. One, governments are only as good as the people we elect to be in government. And that's why I think all of you, if you don't like government, be a part of it. But Lee has also said to the students, I want you to go back and experience the vigil. I want you to go back and actually walk that walk and be, as Mary Vecchio said, be a lantern to pass on the knowledge and the quest for justice to the next generation. So thank you, Lee, for taking all of my students back to Kent. He's financing the trip. They're flying JetBlue. We got a very good rate. <laughs> and we'll be staying uh, there for a couple of days. And again, it's people like you that make Emerson so special. Because some people give to buildings and general funds, and what you give to the future by, is by enriching minds. So thank you, Lee. Thank you. With that in mind, I also want to thank Pete Hall, who's standing in the back, because Pete is someone, just like Shepard, who, for whatever reason, and Vito Silvestri, I keep running into people from Ohio who remind me that I need to continue with Kent. But Pete, uh, his grandfather was someone who was a very close friend of Governor Rhodes. And you saw Governor Rhodes. Governor Rhodes was uh, quite a bombastic type. And his grandfather used to come to my class and actually express those feelings because he believed them. And he would say, I like Dr. Payne, but he's just liberal. Uh, I'm going to tell you what it's really all about. So Pete, thank you so much for sharing your, your grandfather and your family. And a part of that, though, is someone, again, continuing to give. That is Helen Rose. Helen knew of my passion for Kent when I was at the University of Illinois. Kent State occurred. I was going to go to Harvard to law school and then suddenly decided that, and we'll explain who this guy is in just a moment. Uh, I was gonna go and suddenly Kent occurred, so I decided to do a paper, which turned into a master's degree, then a PhD and deferred law school. Then I decided to write a book. I did a play uh, and we do these types of seminars. And Helen said 25 years afterwards, have those two people ever met? John Philo and Mary Vecchio. And I said, I don't think so. So she said, let's have a conference and let's have those two people meet. And I said to John, I called him, I'd known him over the years, I knew both of them, I want to bring you to Emerson, I want you to meet Mary Vecchio. John, what was your immediate thought on that? Oh, hell no. <laughs> was it too happy because? Well, <clears throat> this poor woman had a horrible life after she appeared, after she was tracked down. It took two weeks to find out who she really was. And then when he did track her down, he found out she was a 14-year-old runaway from Opalaka, Florida. And of course, immediately sent home and arrested for street vagrancy, for looking the wrong way, for everything. And just had a horrible, horrible life. Um, and someone interviewed her, and I, someone passed a story on to me where it said this photo ruined her life. And I was like, jeez. That's a, that's a heavy, that's a heavy anchor to be on. And, um, you know, there was a lot to deal with, and, and what do I mean by that? There was being a survivor, 
uh, is that you have to you have to look at uh, you know who was wounded to my right, who was killed to my left and behind me, his brother, uh, and then this poor woman, and, and trying to deal with how on earth did I survive this, and then to have the extra weight of, and not only that, but you ruin a couple of people's lives and stuff like that. So I really wasn't excited to meet her. Although there was a part of me that wanted to apologize and, and give my side of the story and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but if it was my sister or my brother there, I would still shoot the picture and try to get it out. Um, so I came to Emerson and have been glad that I, that I did. A wonderful I think, person. I was going to say, I think the one thing that I would urge all of you is I think Emerson has a very unique mission. It's a mission of connecting people. And you are agents to connect people. So we were able to connect those two and marry immediately with a group of 41 media people from around the world, Germany, England, France was there. She looked at John and John was trembling and he had told me, I don't know if this is a good idea. And she said, John, that picture is part of God's plan for us and we helped in the war. And I think when you look at history, people will say that was an example of people realized that the war had come home. We were killing our young kids. First at Kent State, and then later at Jackson State, which we'll be talking about. I do want to add, and this just was by fate, uh, Mary Vecchio, unfortunately, is not here tonight because she had a surgery. She thought she was going to be able to come, and then she called this morning and said she had tremendous issues with rotor cuff, etc. So she's planning on coming in the fall. But when I was lamenting over that, I suddenly got a Facebook a messenger response because I've been re trying to reach Russell Miller. This is Jeff's brother, whom I've met many years ago, and his wonderful mother, Elaine Holstein. And suddenly I realized my sister Janice, who's always from above, directed me in the right direction because all of a sudden a picture came up of Janice, and then you called. And I said, could you come today and talk about what it's been for your life? So this is Russell, Jeff Miller's brother, and he's going to talk about some of the struggles and some of the issues and his wonderful mother's ability to connect people. But without further ado, so welcome back to Emerson. Thank you. So just to put some context to it, so I was three years older than my brother. I had gone to school up in Michigan and Michigan State. I graduated a year and a half before this, the Kent shootings. So at this point, uh, the day of the shootings, I was working in uh, New Jersey. And uh, let me just jump a little bit, like 53 years. I got a, I got a, uh, a Facebook post to a life, from a lifelong buddy of mine yesterday. And he, is, he attached a picture. He had been drafted and was in Vietnam from like 1969 to 1970. And he sends this picture. He says, 53 years ago today, this is me flying home. There was no pump and ceremony, no ticker tape parade. They just dropped me off at the airport and then I got a bus and I went home. And the amazing thing from my perspective was the, the day he's referring to was two weeks prior to the Kent shootings. And um, my brother had taken spring break, came home to Long Island, and um, he and I double dated into Manhattan uh, on that same day. And so I had a wonderful time with my brother and our respective girlfriends at that moment. And then he went back to Michigan, he went back to Ohio, and I went back to work in, in, New, in New Jersey. So there was, that was, you know, how one one thing about this Ken thing is that it just keeps going and coming back to you, and there's this this constant uh, pulls and pushes that uh, that is quite remarkable. I'm sure, I'm sure all of us can can relate to that because. Um, I, I wish I knew where to start this conversation because I'm just kind of rambling. But uh, but but you, uh, you you think it's 53 years ago and you think nobody really remembers it nor cares at this point, and then something comes up that uh, that surprises you. Okay, and uh, I got a I got a call from Robin Young of uh, NPR uh, two weeks ago. He's telling me that uh, the story about Kent State is is trending on NPR <laughs> every day this week, and. Uh, I found that interesting. I mean, why would it? Uh, I think it's I mean, we're it's trending at Emerson. Maybe that's it. Maybe we're trending it at Emerson. 
Yeah. Well, that could very well be. We've got social media people here, right? That could very well be. There's got to be something that triggered it. Well, the one thing I was going to ask is, of course, John, you've told the story many, many times. But John was a student. And it gets better every time. Yes, he, but yes, he gets better. <laughs> He was a student and he was told by his professor in journalism, of course, Professor Strzok is here, Professor Brown, I think we also have Sharifa Roberts as well as Marianne Taylor, maybe Carrie. Uh, professor said, go out and pretend this is going to be a historical event. And John, can you take it from there? Yes. Um, uh, the last thing I saw on Ken was on May 1st was the bearing of the Constitution near the Victory Bell. And I shot that for no one. And I said, I got to get out of here because I had to finish my senior project, which was large format macro photography of jewelry. And uh, it was going to be against the green moss and winter green, tea berry. And uh, I knew a place up in central Pennsylvania to do that. So I left for the weekend. And uh, sleeping out in the woods, turn on my AM radio and hear, oh, there's a, 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 a Penn State University. A, 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 since I was only about 30 miles from Penn State, I said, wow, we're having a lot of trouble at Penn State. I, you know, radio reception was not good. Listened again, and finally it dawned on me about the third newscast that they were saying Penn State, which uh, I couldn't believe. Um, drove back Sunday to find National Guard, a burnout ROTC building. I had three roommates who were all working for national publications. And I felt, <laughs> I, fit, I missed everything. I missed. Governor Rhodes, I missed the burning of the ROTC building, I missed the trashing of the town, I missed the set down in front of me. I was the most depressed photographer you ever saw. And um, and I had to open up the labs, and I couldn't open up the labs until 8 o'clock when the curfew was lifted on Monday. And everyone was coming in and <laughs> checking out equipment and saying, oh, you're going to the rally at noon. I don't know why. Why, why would I go to the rally? It's over. This, this is crazy. And I had two professors who were wonderful and supportive. And of course, seeing that they had this horse face guy checking out equipment, said, well, you know, the whole story has changed. It's not about Kent anymore. It's about student protest in America. Why don't you see, you got an hour. We closed the labs from 12 to 1. I hear there's a rally at noon. See if you can get a picture of student protest in America. Self-assignment for no one. And uh, since the second professor said the same thing, I said, you know what, I'd be an idiot if I didn't do this. So I went out there, and uh, it, was, it was easy. It was like it was out in the main street here. I didn't have to walk, all I had to do was walk out of the building, and there it was, you know, a protest going on. And I saw the Jeep pull up, and this is an illegal assembly, and all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, I'm waiting for my Robert Kappa moment. <laughs> Students and guards are clashing. But there was always this buffer of the commons, you know, 100 yards, maybe 200, 150 yards. The guard would move, the students would move. They shoot tear gas, the tear gas would blow away, you know, shoot another, blow away. And I'm walking back and forth, back and forth between the thing, looking at my watch, saying, well, this is a terrible, terrible idea, a terrible day. I'm not getting anything. And finally, I think they ran out of tear gas or something, and they decided to move across the commons. And I saw this one sergeant with this giant nightstick, and I said, I'll follow this guy because he looks like he's going to look for somebody to clock. And, uh, uh, I was amazed they let me walk with him, and I did, and uh, they found no one. And when we got to the other side of Taylor Hall, there was um, the main body of guard who was always trapped on the practice of rugby football. So, uh, you want me to keep on going <laughs> the rest of the day? I don't know. It was, and that's when I saw... Uh, Alan Canfora, waving the black flag, uh, and, I, and I suddenly came alive as a photographer said, oh, here, here's a picture. I'm in the wrong place. But let me get behind him on the hillside. He ran off the hillside down into the dip of the practice football field, waving the black flag. Uh, guardsmen immediately had a rifle line, squad pointing their rifles at him. And the rest of the guard, about 70 or 80 of them, were just milling in the background. And so I said, wow, this is the best photo I've ever taken. This is this is what I came out for. It's like 12:20. So, <laughs> all right, let's end this thing. I, this is this is a great photo. I got student protest in America. I was real happy. And uh, and I'm you know being a photographer, looking around, see if anybody else made it. Realized that the only other photographers out there were 
all the photographers I knew from the student publications. And there was about five to seven of us different times. So uh, it was a short while after that, the guard regrouped, marched back up the hill, they descended, disappeared from my sight, and almost immediately reappeared. And when they reappeared, they were firing. They were at the top of the hill, firing down the hill. I was still three quarters of the way up the hill. Um, <clears throat> Saw, I wanted to get a picture of the guard firing, figured it was a, a scare tactic. I saw no reason for the shooting. Uh, <coughs> thought they were firing blanks. Put the camera to my eye and there was, I said, oh, here's a guy aiming a rifle at me. His gun goes off, the sculpture in front of me erupts into a cloud of rust, a chunk of bark comes off the tree. The tree was penetrated by, I think, the same bullet. And I said, oh, wow, someone's using, and you hear a bullet go by, you're in, so someone's using, and you realize they're all using live ammunition. And uh, it seemed to go on endlessly, 12 seconds, 13 seconds, something like that. And I said, I gotta get out of here. This is absolutely crazy. I think I took a picture. I was mad that I didn't get a picture of the guard shooting. Got a picture of people slowly picking themselves off the ground. Knew there were people wounded behind that metal sculpture. They were to the right of me. And I did a slow turn to my left saw this, this body on the pavement in amongst, before the parked cars. And this was seconds. This was seconds after the shooting stopped. And the amount of blood was, it was indescribable in how fast and how quickly it was moving. And I ran and I ran and I stopped myself when I got down and I said, all right, boy, why are you running? It's all over. And I stayed with, with Jeffrey Miller because I knew that person was dead. I'm not a doctor, I, I, you know, I just, you just, you, you saw the damage that the bullet did and there's no life in that body. Uh, there, there's just no way. And I stayed with that because I, I just couldn't believe what happened. I knew there were people assisting the people behind the metal sculpture. And I had no idea that there were people even further away that were shot and killed uh, in that parking lot. But Jeffrey Miller was the closest. 220 feet away, something like that. Um, once again, being a photographer at that time, the paranoia at the time, no one really liked you. Uh, obviously, law officials didn't like you and students didn't like you because they thought you were working for some government agency or some spy agency, unless they really knew you, you know, through the through the publication, which was which was hard to you know, establish. So I had people screaming at me, like, what kind of pig am I shooting, shooting these images? I think I remember taking enough of it and finally screaming back, no one's gonna believe this happened. Uh, I stayed, stayed with Jeffrey Miller until his body was removed. And then witnessed bizarre stuff. I mean, while his body was on the ground, the guard that I followed up finally came over that weren't part of the shooting came over and flipped his body over with a boot. And this, you know, saw that whole thing happen. And then this guy later testified that there was a gun under the body of Jeffrey Miller. Which was, of course, untrue. Untrue. Yeah. And, and, uh, and finally, the people were starting to wake up to what had happened. And they started screaming at these guardsmen who came over to the body. And they backed off. They, they backed away and threw a grenade in the air, just a smoke flash grenade scare us all away from being pursuing them, just with gestures of outrage and pointing. And then, after his body was removed, you witnessed people not knowing how to react to this thing that they were trapped in. Someone took that flag that I think Alan Canfora dropped, dipped it in the blood of Jeffrey Miller, flung it around, sprayed us all with droplets of just blood. And then I went up the hill where the shooting started and saw that the guard had returned to their protection of the ashes of the ROTC building. And I went down with a group that sat there and demanded, why did you shoot? Why did you shoot? And we sat there and the road came back, if you don't move, we're gonna shoot again, and no one left. It was the scariest 
part of that day for me because everything else was a surprise. But it was a, a conscious decision. If they're staying, I'm staying. And finally, Glenn Frank, and among other professors, um, got us to turn and leave. And we were also surrounded by another detachment of guards that surrounded that body. And, and as far as we were concerned, and we were told, the university is closed, go home. That was it. I couldn't even get back in the building that I worked in. So John, could I interrupt just for a second? When, one thing when you've discussed with the class, and I think with Lee, and maybe with Mark's group uh, today, you indicated that Mary Vecchio, because of her age, 14-year-old runaway, that she captured an emotion that the students there did not show. Right. That's, in, in staying, I'm skipping over some stuff, I'm sorry. I uh, got off on another tangent. But the only person to come up to the body of Jeffrey Miller was Mary Vecchio. There were people that would stand next to it, get close to it. And after Mary, there was one other student that touched, touched his hand. But, uh, before the guy rolled him over with his boot. But Mary uh, knelt down, and I and I, I could see something building. I mean, this was, this was an emotional moment. And I knew I was running out of film. And um, I wanted to get more head on. And I kept moving and focusing, moving and focusing. And I shot a picture of her next to the body. And I shot another picture, and I stopped myself from shooting anymore. I said, you're going to run out of film. You're going to run out of film. Don't don't shoot anymore. Um, and then as I kept approaching and focusing, she let out with a, with a, a scream. And I shot. That was a reaction to her scream. <coughs> that role came out. I think I had one more, two more frames after that. And the role was empty. Rewound it, reloaded the camera, and went on and did the rest of the time. If I could interrupt just one moment. Russell, <clears throat> when did you find out about your brother's death? And uh, could you explain a little bit about that? Because yeah, well, your mother was. First of all, I just wanted to say this is, I've never heard that day as graphic as John just recited it. It just makes your fingers tremble. Uh, that's pretty crazy stuff. Um, I was, um, as I mentioned, I was living in, uh, in New Jersey, and my grandmom uh, was in the Bronx. And it just happened to be, uh, that day I dropped, a, I owned a motorcycle and I dropped it off at, a, at the dealership in Manhattan that day and was just comfortably taking the subway back to my grandmother's house. And uh, when I got there, uh, it was probably six o'clock and, uh, and I had no clue about what was going on all day. And, um, and the TV was, was rolling all kinds of stuff about, about Kent. And I remember she, she said, do you think Jeff wasn't there, do you think? I said, of course Jeff was there. I mean, <laughs> that's exactly who Jeff was to have been demonstrating in that situation. But we didn't know anything, and they weren't listing names of, uh, of who was killed. Um, and so we just were watching the news for maybe an hour, and uh, then we got a call from my, uh, my, my, uh, my aunt uh, that uh, said she was, she was coming over from Queens. To, uh, to us, and uh, we still knew nothing. And then she came over and she knocked on the door and she told us what happened. And she told us about my brother. And, and, and at least we heard it from her and not on TV. So that was, that was, uh, that was bizarre. And um, then the next thing that, uh, that comes to mind is that it, uh, I was living blocks away from Fairleigh Dickinson University in, in Jersey. And, uh, my roommate was uh, was attending school there, so they said, "You got to come over because there was a big demonstration at, at FDU that that evening. This is the night the night after." And uh, so I found myself standing up on a on a on a on a bandstand and talking to uh, way more people than are here, you know. And it was just very you know hard to come to grips with, uh, you know. It just it just came real fast, and I was I wasn't at Kent State, so I didn't see any of the stuff that was going on. Um, but then I got a, I got a call, I'll ramble a little bit because that's what I do, and uh, I got a call from um, Ted Kennedy's office. He, he heard, I mean, I, nobody knew who I was, and then all of a sudden everybody knew who I was. And he's, he said, I'd like to invite you to come to Washington, D.C. to, uh, there's a huge rally 
going to happen this weekend in, in, in D.C. So I said, sure. And, uh, and off I went. They put me on a plane. There was this, uh, this woman from uh, Life magazine that uh, came with me. And, uh, and I met all kinds of interesting people. I mean, from my perspective, it was, it, was, it was two sides to this thing. I met some really interesting people. Obviously, you're the most. But, uh, <laughs> but, but Ted Kennedy, uh, Mrs. Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. Zeus. <laughs> All kinds of people, a couple of interesting senators. Um, and then, this is the coolest part. Um, we go to the rally, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And, uh, and, I, and I come back to New York, and I get off the, um, off the bus to go to my mom's, uh, she lives in a garden apartment. And I'm walking down the street, and everybody's sitting out on the steps of, the, of their apartments. And there's this huge stretch limo parked in front of my mom's, my, my mom's house. And uh, so I walk in there, and there's Ro Nelson Rockefeller sitting in the living room talking to my mom with another guy named Louis Lefkowitz, who was the attorney general for the city of New York at that time. And we were just talking. I was on the floor, and we just the four of us were just talking for the next two or three hours. And I got to know <laughs> Nelson Rockefeller, who at that time was the governor of New York. He then became a vice president. Um, so I, I found him to be a very interesting dude. I mean, I, he was a Republican, which was, you know, which turned me off right off the get-go. But, but, but I really liked him. And um, one interesting thing about him is that uh, he in instituted a lot of really hard laws about marijuana possession and things like that, things that you might find uh, close to your heart. And, um, and, and the reason he was really hard on that was because he had a, a son that died of an overdose. And probably a lot of people to this day have no clue about that. But, uh, but that's what drove him to do all the things that he did in his capacity as governor. Okay, John, one thing I'd like to do is take you back. When you took the film, uh, you shared with our class that immediately Kent State was closed. And if you were a student, you were given two hours to get all of your stuff out of your dorm. And you went down to a bus, and the person that was driving the bus to evacuate you was a guardsman. So you were a little bit paranoid about that. Could you tell us about how you got your film to Pennsylvania and some of that tribulation? Right. right. Um, the <clears throat> there was a tremendous paranoia at the time. I mean, the music sort of tells you that. Um, what had happened is when it was determined that the campus was closed, you couldn't get back into the classrooms, get back to your dorm. Uh, I, the only option I had was the f go find my car, which was, was beyond the lot that was shot up, the next lot over, get in and drive away. But being that they had blocked all the intersections in campus, I had to drive around campus to get to my apartment as the crow's flies. Uh, from where I worked on campus to where my apartment was like 300 yards, but to get there I had to drive like six miles all around campus uh, to get to the other side. As I was in driving and leaving that parking lot and on the main highway between Kent and Ravenna, there was a guardsman on the telephone pole and I'm stopped at a light and I watched the phone line be cut, literally cut in half, dropped. I mean, it wasn't a repairman, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a transformer blown, this was the phone line, it was being cut and dropped. And I said, oh, this is not good. Well, what I failed to tell you is when we were waiting down there on the, on main part of campus, the initial radio report. The first news flash was that two guardsmen and two students were killed in a shootout. And everyone that was there knew that was the biggest damn line they'd ever heard. A shootout. A shootout. So like the OK Corral. Yeah, right. You know, students have guns. Students have guns, guards have guns, and after the battle there's two dead on each side. And I said, oh, this is, this is, seeing the phone line go down, I said, this is really scary. I had to go through three roadblocks around campus, through guardsmen, got to my apartment, and I said, they're going to be coming after me. They have to. There was no professional people over on that side of the, the hill where the shooting was done. It was all us student photographers. I didn't even want to start calling the student. We didn't have cell phones. You know, you, you, you had to have people's, and I said, nope, I'm not even going to let them know that I have film. I don't know where Howard went, Howard Ruffner. Um, he, he, he was our sort of leader. He had a good, nice contract for that weekend for Life Magazine. He was a great guy. And he, did, he had 
most comprehensive photo coverage of all of that weekend in the day. And um, I decided to hide the film in my Volkswagen in the hood. Not the hubcap, the hood. I don't know how Washington Post got hubcap out of hood, but I can't imagine hiding film in a hubcap. Anyhow, once I got out of, my, my job was to get out of Ohio. I was just that paranoid. And got out of Ohio, as soon as I got on the uh, Pennsylvania Turnpike, the first red stop, rest stop, made a collect call to my little newspaper in Western PA, the Valley Daily News, the Daily Dispatch, circulation 35,000, and talked to my boss and he said, did you get anything? And I said, I think so. And, and the um, house, I knew I started the day with six rolls in my right pocket, finished the day with six rolls in my left pocket, scratched the roll, of, uh, of Alan Canfora and, and also at uh, Mary Vecchio. Uh, didn't know their names at the time. And uh, said, I think so. I couldn't remember shooting pictures. I remember seeing pictures. I couldn't remember shooting pictures. Uh, we got to, I got to the paper about two hours later, uh, only to find out th how I would normally <coughs> process film. They had a new thing called a VersaMath machine. And the machine was going to process the film. Of course, this led it to my more paranoia, and I said, "Okay, here's a lesser role. Here's here's a role when I left campus. We have the you know the professors with the bullhorns telling us to clear the campus. My last my last photos were a bullet hole in the metal sculpture. I had to see it to make sure that's what I saw. It's the last thing I think photographed, uh, like a two or three picture sequence of that before I left. And we processed that role that came out fine. We did the Mary role, and." Uh, and while we were making prints, the publisher showed up and said, well, this is great. We'll save this for tomorrow's paper. I said, no, we can't save it for tomorrow's paper. I didn't drive all this way to hold it to increase your photo sales or your newspaper sales, what, 50 papers, 100 papers for 35,000 circulation. So it ended up into a big argument. It seemed like the whole day was a big argument, more, more paranoid. And I think I bought them off basically by saying, how about if we put the Valley Daily News Daily Dispatch credit on the bottom of the photo? And I sort of won that argument. Uh, he left in a huff. My boss left right behind him. And they said, well, OK, you got the prints. It looks good, whatever. Um, schedule them. I schedule them to, try to schedule them to New York for the AP. And uh, that was a fight. We had to analog days. We had, it took 12 minutes to transmit a picture with caption. And in a good day, you could do 120 photos, black and white, not color, black and white photos. And um, so I tried to go to New York. And I was reprimanded for interrupting talking on the network because I really wasn't on the network, but I was interfering with the network. And they said, well, uh, we're taking all these pictures from the Akron Beacon Journal who had a photographer there. What do, what, do you, what do you have, and where are you from, and how far are you from Canton? I said, I'm 120 miles away. I think I have a good photo. And they said, well, can you hang around till like 8.30, 9 o'clock, because that's about time we can get to you. And I said, sure. And it turned out the Akron Beacon Journal, which was transmitting photos, had a problem. Their photo lifted off their optical bench on the transmitter, and they said, all right, well, while we're waiting for them to retry that, we'll take your photo. So I sent the photo. Started a 1930s machine called a Muirhead. It was a micro groove barrel. I had the print wrapped around with the caption. And I had to phase the electronic motor to get the speed to the drum, throw the clutch, it started the, uh, and throw the switch, and it started transmitting line by line the photograph. Twelve minutes later, you would have a, a complete photo. And. Uh, after I started that, I ran out to the newsroom to watch it build, you know, frame line by line. And uh, after it was transmitted, I turned up the volume on the network to hear what anybody had to say. And all there was white noise of shh. You know, oh, damn, did I not throw the switch properly? And it turned out, well, the guy looks at it and says, hey, it's a good photo. Can you resend it? Because I only sent it to the, they had networks, I think the Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey leg of, of the AP network. And so I had to retransmit it and retransmit it again for the nation, and I think retransmit it again for a world, uh, world class. And then we took a several photos. But it seemed like everything 
everything was a fight. And then after all that, someone said, what do you remember most about the day? And the thing was, there was no moment. Because after you finish one job, you had another task. I had to write a first person account. And then you write a first person account. And by that time, people are questioning you about the photos that you sent. Like, is this really, did this really happen? Are these not, are these for real? Are these photos for real? Go, yeah. So you have these conversations and you're trying to write a story. And pretty soon another day goes by and I think I was in bed. And my mother wakes me. I think I got to bed at, I think a day later, like five in the morning. And I'm being awake, shaking awake at 10. And my mother's going like, um, are you up? I go, obviously not. You know, I mean, I'm up. And she says, well, um, there are two gentlemen in the kitchen uh, that want to talk to you. And I said, oh, I said, interviews? They want to do an interview? She said, no, they're from the FBI. <laughs> and I said, well, I I'm not even dressed yet. You know, and she goes, it's okay. I gave them cake and coffee. <laughs> so I went down and we did, I think we did four hours. I did four hours of interview with the FBI. What type of questions were they asking? Just tell me in your own words what happened. It was basically the most, to this day, it's the most, it's the, well, the best document I have of my testimony. But you also made friends that day because you found them again on your way to the airport, correct? Yeah, well, the interview ended like four hours later, sometime like three in the afternoon, and they said, well, are you going to be in this area? Can we have your film? I said, no, you can't have the film. And I don't have the film with me. And I, I didn't tell them where it was. It was locked up at the paper. Anyhow, they said, do you have any plans on leaving the, the area? And I said, no, I'm not. Wait a minute. On Friday, I remember talking to a, a Chicago TV show. And they promised me that if I get on an 11 o'clock flight and fly to Chicago, I'm going to make a 3 o'clock show. And then uh, I'll, by 4 o'clock, I'll be on a flight home and be home in time for a late dinner. I said, I'm going to Chicago on Friday. And they said, great. And so Friday came. I never heard from the FBI. And Friday came and I'm driving to the airport. And I'm looking in my rear view mirror, and it's the same two guys that interviewed me, following me the whole way to the airport. So when I tell you about the paranoia at the time, there really was a paranoia. So John, do you see any of them out there? Are they still <laughs> They're all wearing masks. <laughs> they could be. They're all wearing masks. Yes. 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 But, uh, we have we have a couple of minutes, I think, for a couple more questions. And you'll have some time because we have another reception. Our students, we have, we have more food, and then we have the Southwick. But one I was going to ask you, Russell, and you'll have some time then to interact with the two of them, is when Mary Beck Gill came in 1995, she saw the Kent State Requiem play, which was based on uh, letters that I'd had from the Schroeders, Mrs. Schroeder, Bill Schroeder, who you've seen and heard about. And she saw this, I think Dr. Sylvester was there, I think Jane Pierce, she's here. Jane has been on both ends of it. She was a student of mine, so she has had me, when I've been teaching the class, and now she's seeing it around, so she can't get away from Kent State either, so thank you, Jane. But Mary said in the play, she said, I want to be a part of this. And what do you say to Mary Vecchio? Uh, of course she could be a part of it. So at the end, Mrs. Schroeder is realizing that Bill is not guilty and that he can move forward because he's sort of caught in this purgatorial area. And Mary said, I want to say something at the end. And I said, and I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, I'm going to have to write something. And then all of a sudden she just said, it's the responsibility of each generation, as Plato said, to pass the knowledge to the future generation so they can continue to add to it. And here's my lantern to your generation. Beautiful. That's what I think it's so good about Mary. Russell, when we were doing the play at Kent, and the only time Mary has been invited to go to Kent is when she's come with us. Kent State still has not invited her. She was doing the play, and your mother, once again, one of those moments that you didn't plan for, your mother was there at the time, one of the bravest individuals I've ever met, Elaine Holstein. And she came up to Mary, and she said, Mary, I am Jeff's mother. I've never met you. Can you tell me, did my son suffer when he was killed? Now again, you're thinking, okay, you're bringing these two people together. What was it about your mother who was so strong and yet <laughs> such an emotional rock in terms of telling the story? I guess, I guess the, the, what I see 
is there were four kids and there were four sets of parents. And uh, my mom was a very positive person and not every parent was. So there are a couple of other parents that uh, became angry till the day they died. And uh, it really helps in this life to, to be generally a positive person because you'll, you'll go through all kinds of strange things and, uh, and there's always a positive side to it. You can, you, know, you can keep it from tearing you apart. And uh, that's who my mom was. She was a, uh, she worked in high school. She, uh, she was guidance secretary actually at my high school. And, um, and she was very young. She, uh, we, she was very liberal. Um, she, could, she could relate to the kids. Uh, I had no trouble relating to her. So, you know, she was, she was the perfect mom from my perspective. And, uh, and, and she just, she handled, I mean, there was so much going on and uh, she became the, the face of the parents for many years. I was invisible for many years because uh, the media just goes after the, the, the parents, if you go back to the 80s. Uh, and then after time, my mom said, this is, you know, I'm not sure how long I can hold on to this, because she, she ended up living until she was 96. So then I became the, uh, the, the sponsor for my family. And to be honest, my, my son is taking it on right now. He's, uh, he's more and more excited about the Kent State uh, from a historical perspective than, uh, than, than he ever was. And uh, so going forward, he'll be the guy. That and his name is Jeff. Name. And his name, of course we named him Jeff after my brother. So, uh, so it's, 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 it's a little crazy. Um, but, um, but we've had, we've never really had trouble coming to grips with the whole thing. I mean, it, it, that's a little bizarre to say maybe, but uh, you know, once you get past, get past the obvious parts, um, you, you start looking for ways in which you can turn it into a positive message. And my mom was really good that way. She, uh, she, she wrote articles. Uh, she was uh, on a lot of shows. Uh, uh, you know, I remember. Uh, she forgave me. She forgave you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never knew that you were. Oh, no, we were the American for ABC, and she was, we just blubbered over each other, you know, but she was wonderful. Wonderful. There was one thing that kind of doesn't relate to that, that question, but, but it's, but I find it interesting. A thing I've learned over the years is that, um, again, I went to school in the late 60s. So uh, when I went to school, people, uh, students, when they graduated, they're trying to figure out a way not to get drafted to go to Vietnam. And um, so a lot of kids entered the, uh, the National Guard because that was a way to escape going to Vietnam. So when, after this happened, I was living in New Jersey. The guy that owned the, the laundromat that I used to use just happened by coincidence to have been a member of the Ohio National Guard. Uh, he wasn't there that day, um, but he was a nice guy. And uh, so I, I just had this perception that the guys that were involved were my perception of, 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 of students who uh, graduated and, and joined the National Guard to get away from going to have Vietnam. And I didn't have any negative connotation associated with that. Fast forward, there was a lawsuit that happened in Cleveland that lasted like 10 years. And once or twice, I went to it. And you're sitting in the courtroom, and you see the guys from the guard that were involved. These were not 22-year-old ex-students. These were 30 and 40-year-old guys that were hardcore kind of guys. Uh, they were not my type of guy at all. And uh, that was... That was the revelation, revelation that, that I came to uh, over the next, like, it took 10 years for that to happen. But uh, these guys were hardcore. They were very conservative. Uh, they had no trouble at all shooting kids. And um, so it, it gave, gave me some perspective on, actually, on Ohio generally. <laughs> I think with that, we will be sort of stopping for this particular conversation. I do invite you to continue the dialogue in terms of the reception. We'll be coming back to the Southwood, which we'll be examining, again, some of the uh, poems as well as scenes from the play that I did on Kent State at Requiem. It also is going to include Ron Stokes, uh, who was a graduate of Jackson State. He's the father of Trinity Stokes, and he's going to be giving some insights with regard to Jackson State. We were hoping that President Peoples would be able to join us. He was someone who was just an incredible hero that evening. But he's not in the best of health, but uh, hopefully we'll get something from him later. So with that, I'd like to thank Russell as well as John. We've got a song that we'd like to end with here.
briefly as we have you go out to the uh, discussion. I think this is dedicated to all the teachers as well as all of us. And I think you'll know again it's from one of my favorites. Teacher Trouble Well. So with that, let's have a reception. Let's have